Leslie put these questions together to kind of help facilitate. Yeah. They're good questions, Jennifer. Yeah. Does she do a great job? Yeah. Okay. She's, yeah, yeah. she's amazing. Um, and what we'll do is take this and then we'll probably use it and we'll take yeah. segments of it okay. and put it throughout. So feel free to just hold a conversation, be comfortable, introduce yourselves. That would be most helpful. And she's got a little, uh, I think, kind of a nice little. Uh, <laughs> she's uh, done that. Does this look, does this look like a reasonable introduction to you? If not, I did it. No, it's, it's great. I always think it's very, I asked somebody once, because that most beloved yeah. meditation teacher started appearing in my bio, and <laughs> I said something to my publisher at the time, like, how do they know? Did they, like, take a survey or somewhere? And said, I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things happen to me like that. I'll go, who said that? Oh, we made it up. We thought you sounded good, yeah. so. That's good. All right. So that's, does that help give it a frame? Yeah, that's good. And it will okay. be, we will uh -huh. do snippets um, and put it on the website. Okay. Um, now it's up to you actually whether to use the term Buddhist or not, you know, depending on your... Well, we have a very, I'd be careful with the term Buddhist. What's the term Because it's in my oh, bio, yeah. um, because it, it's sort of an extra, you don't need yeah. to say it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Are we interviewing a left-wing co communist uh, agitator? Here? Yes, for the military. I, I <laughs> taught in, uh, at the FD, the Federal Trade Commission once years ago, and they said now, uh, you can't mention meditation. And I said, but... That's why you brought me can I, can I mention... <laughs> no, they wanted me to lead it, but not call it that. Uh -huh. Like, call it stress reduction or relaxing or something like that. And I, and they, but they kept using the word Buddhist. I thought, it's not odd. They can call me a Buddhist, but not... They can call you a Buddhist, but they can't use the you word meditation. meditation. Yeah. We'll do the opposite here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, okay, where do you go? Adam, come back, wherever you are. Um, all right, yeah, 30 minutes, and then um, if you don't come out in about okay. 40, I'll come in. <laughs> okay, that's right. All right. Can you find Adam? Yes, we're all set for recording. You know where to push the button or whatever? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're On that note, okay, I will leave because I seem to be holding up the show as okay. usual. Is it, is it, is it started? It's gone? He's, he's yeah, going. yeah, we're in. Oh, okay. oh, so we have all of mine. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys need anything else? I don't think so. Thank you. Do you need to do a sound check or you know it's recording? No, okay, we've already, we've checked. Okay, great. So, thank you. You're still together? Yeah, my pleasure. Let me make sure my phone is off. Hey, sweetie, I'm just sitting down for the interview with Jim Salzberg. Is everything okay? Yeah. Uh, 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 oh, he's the guy at uh, Cordain. Uh, Lauren Cordain. C O R D A I N. Yeah, and the car, the cards got canceled today too. Just let you know, I tried to use it. So, okay, I'll talk to you in a while. Bye. So, should we go? So I'm Charles Raison. I'm a psychiatrist and uh, someone who's done scientific studies on meditation now for the better part of a decade. Not much of a meditator myself, but fortunately today I am sitting with Sharon Salzberg, who's one of the country's most beloved meditation teachers, and who's really made. Uh, an amazing uh, specialty of, of making meditation accessible to folks. She's the best-selling author of the books Real Happiness and Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. Uh, Sharon uh, does a remarkable job of introducing ancient concepts and teachings uh, uh, related to meditation in ways that make uh, contemporary Americans living in the society that we do sort of grasp, comprehend, and resonate with. Uh, she's a co-founder of the meditation, the Insight Meditation Center in Barney, Massachusetts, uh, which was co-founded by her in 1974, uh, and she has decades of meditation teaching experience. We're really uh, honored to have her visit the University of Arizona again this year, uh, sharing her wisdom and, and teachings about the relationship of loving kindness to the spiritual path. So thank you for sitting down and, and, and talking with her for a second. Let me just start with a a general question, but it really, I think, gets to the core of, I think, why many of us are interested in meditation for one reason or other, which is the question of, of how it impacts people's lives. So you've been teaching meditation for years. I know this is kind of a hard question to answer, but, but can you talk to me a little bit about how you feel meditation has personally changed or benefited your life? <laughs> <laughs> but it is a little bit hard because yeah. I started when I was 18, so, and I'm, Fat, far, far from 18 at this point, <laughs> but uh, 
you know, so it's, it's been the core of so much of my life. I will tell you that when I went to India, which is how I, I learned meditation, I went through college um, in this program, I was uh, very confused, I was very unhappy, I had a very disrupted childhood, um, lots of loss and separation and conflict. And, and I, also, I came from one of those families where uh, so much was going on, but nothing was ever really talked about, like many people's families. And so I really struggled terribly with the feelings inside of me, and I felt I needed something um, that would help me look at all those emotions, deal with them in a better way, uh, be a happier person. And, and there I was, I was 18, I was in college, and this program opportunity happened where you could create a project and go anywhere in the world. And, and so I thought, I'm going to go to India and learn how to meditate. And this was, you know, it was like 1970, so these things were happening, you know. And so they said, okay, go. And, and that's how I actually started. And, and I, I really do believe I found exactly what I was looking for in meditation. I wasn't interested in uh, something religious or philosophical or, or based on a belief system. I wanted to know if there were some very practical tools I might use that would help me be happier. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and what made you... How did you know enough about meditation before you went to know that that's what you were going to look for, if you know what I mean? That's even funnier, because I was, um, uh, by the time I was 18, because I had skipped a few grades in New York City, as one often did in that, in that time, I was uh, a junior in college. So in my sophomore year, I needed a philosophy course. It was one of the requirements. And honestly, as far as I can remember, it was kind of a haphazard thing. I looked at the offerings, and I thought, I'll take that Asian philosophy course. It's on Tuesday. I need a Tuesday course. Let me do that. And, and that's where I learned about meditation. Interesting. And, and did you go to India knowing where you were headed? I mean, had you sort of scattered it out where you, you had your mark, if you know what I mean? Or did you go and look around? Or? I went and looked around because I had such a particular range of desires. You know, I didn't want something... Um, I was going to demand, uh, you know, like a conversion to a belief yeah. system. I don't want to reject anything else. I wanted something so practical and, and pragmatic and useful to me that it actually took a while wandering around. And, and a lot of it was kind of odd, you know, how these things happen. It was almost accidental, it seemed. And I heard that there was a... I'd been there for months and not, not able to find what I wanted. And... I heard that there was an international yoga conference going to happen in New Delhi, so I went to that thinking, oh, I'll, you know, I'll find a teacher there. And, and that turned out to be an awful experience. It was, <laughs> it was so dispiriting. The low point was when all these swamis and gurus were up on the stage pushing and shoving against each other to be the first to grab the mic and speak. And I thought, oh, no, I will never find it. But as it turned out, Dan Goldman, who at that time was a graduate student, uh, studying meditation, uh, delivered a paper at that yoga conference. Yeah. And he mentioned he was on his way to an intensive 10-day meditation retreat. No frills, no like intense cultural overlay, just kind of the straight stuff. And I thought, that's it. And it was it. Interesting. So did you, 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 just, did you follow him to the 10-day retreat? Yeah, yeah. You did. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about the, who you found and you know, what happened. Well, what I really found was, it was like an immersion course in, in meditation, and um, the idea was really that uh, meditation is like a skills training. Uh, first of all, skills training and concentration, that most of us are fairly scattered or distracted, if not in every uh, arena of life, at least in some, and, and you don't need to be an experienced meditator to know that. You just sit down to think something through, and you're gone, and our minds jump to the past and we go over and over and over and over some situation which we now can't rectify. <laughs> or our minds jump to the future and we create a scenario that has not happened and may never happen and we're filled with anxiety about that. So we're all over the place. And the theory behind concentration is that we can learn to gather that very scattered and distracted attention and energy and settle, uh, be much more centered. So that was the, the basis of the training. And building on that, uh, it's a skills training in mindfulness, in really being able to take that uh, greater presence and balance and apply it to looking at emotions and the body and relationship and everything, really. Um, so it's a much more open awareness. And, and building on that, also, it's a training. It's considered a training in qualities like loving kindness and compassion. Yeah, yeah. which so, we'll come back to, because that's, that's yeah. sort of an interesting question about how mindfulness and, and, and love and compassion hook up with each other. So, uh, did you, I mean, just, 
interesting. Did you did you know the first day into the retreat that you'd sort of found a path that was going to shape your life this way? I felt like I knew the first moment that I, I heard the teacher give the instruction. Yeah. And I thought, oh, right. I mean, I had no idea it would do this, you know, yeah. that that I would teach or that I would start a center or write books or anything. But you had an immediate sense that yeah. it was it had this sort of pragmatic element yeah. that yeah. would help sort of yeah. organize, calm the mind. Yeah. And, and and, 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 and that was not something that, you know, because one of the interesting things now is that meditation in various forms, intense and watered down, is sort of floating everywhere in our culture, right? But in 1970, I guess that wasn't really so much the case, was it? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I think... I mean, it's it, largely because of folks like you that, that it's yeah. so much floating around now. Yeah, no, I think that is, that is true. And... Uh, that didn't happen because I had that intention, you know, that I had a master plan, <laughs> like, oh, let me, you know, it just happened um, as a consequence of uh, the tremendous benefit I and my colleagues received ourselves. And so coming back as teachers, we just, we just began teaching. But um, I don't think, honestly, I'm, I'm trying to look back, I don't think I would have gone to India if I didn't have to. Yeah. You know, if, if all of these methods and uh, techniques were available, or at least some <laughs> were available uh, in New York or Buffalo, which is where I went to college, or anywhere. I, I would have gone there. But people weren't really talking about training attention. I mean, these are ideas we sort of take for granted now, many of us. They, they have felt into the culture. People study it and all this sort of stuff. But yeah. I guess, you know, those many years ago, these were really fairly shocking, radical, amazing ideas. Oh, yeah. Even 1974, when I, I came back from, I came back I went to India, came back to finish school, and went back to India, and I finally came back in 1974. And I'd be at a party or some social situation, and people would say to me, what do you do? And I had come back with the uh, insistence of my own teachers that I teach. So I'd say, I teach meditation. And they would kind of go, ooh, that's weird. Or, or sometimes they would say, oh, did you meet the Beatles? <laughs> you know, which I hadn't. Like, they went when I was still in high school. <laughs> um, and nowadays, uh, even in sort of odd situations like coming back into the country through customs and immigration, they'll say, what do you do? And I'll say, I teach meditation. And the single most common response I hear is, I'm so stressed out. I could really use some of that. Although my favorite response is, my partner should really meet you. <laughs> that would be really good. And I also hear, um, I tried that once and I failed at it. And that really concerns me. Yeah. You know, people say I failed at it because I couldn't stop thinking or I couldn't make my mind blank. And I realize how many ideas are just floating out there about what we should be experiencing and how we'd all benefit, I think, from, from just some clarity. Absolutely. So that, let's talk about that for a second because, you know, so, so you know, I'm, you know, not a very serious man. <laughs> I make no bones about it, sadly, for me. But, you know, I'm a fairly serious researcher of meditation, right? And, and one of the things that struck me is that meditation has become one of these things that that you know, just sounds good to many people, right? So we do these studies and people want to come in and they're all excited. And then they, they sit down and do the meditation. And there is, for many people, I think, a disillusionment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we get a fair... And we're not the only ones. We get a fairly high dropout rate because it, it turns out to be work. So you know, talk. I mean, I think that's exactly right. People, you know, the the attempt. My experience is the attempt to be mindful ensures failure. If if you have as your goal that you you right because the, the, it, there's this paradoxical nature to it that the it's the attempt. It's the failure in many ways that's sort of the teacher in a way. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So talk to me about what are the things you find that are the things that people, if they knew about it, they might not toss in the towel so quick? Um, that's a great question. I think there are many things like that. And one is actually failure is kind of the point. Um, <clears throat> because in something like concentration training, we know that it's not going to be 800 breaths before your mind wanders. You know, that if, if the breath is the object that you're trying to settle attention on, it's going to be one yeah. or two, maybe four if you're having a really good run, <laughs> you know, but it's not going to be a thousand. And, and that's known, that's understood, and that's not a problem because we say that one of the most powerful, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most powerful points of the whole training is the moment when you realize your attention has wandered. It's already gone. You've already gotten lost in some way, or you've fallen asleep or something. And then comes that moment 
when you think, oh, it's been quite some time since I last felt a breath. <laughs> That's considered the critical moment because first of all, we practice letting go. of Whatever has taken us away, thought, fantasy, sensation, whatever it is, we practice letting go. It's what one of my own teachers called exercising the letting go muscle. And then we practice beginning again. So without chastising ourselves and blaming ourselves and going on a rant and feeling like a failure, that's one of the um, kind of secret uh, developments of loving kindness and compassion right there. We practice beginning again, being kind to ourselves. And if you have to do that 70 billion times in a 20 minute session, that's not considered a problem. That's the actual training. But that is so unbelievable. Yes. To us. Yes, it is. Although it's odd, I've never thought this before, but you know when you were talking, I said, you know, that, you've just described in many ways a, a little analogy for what people say with substance abuse problems have to do, right? Many conditions in life are exactly that, right? You fall off the wagon. That's right. You've lost your, you know, you've lost your concentration. And then the question, the, the, the thing that, that separates people that do well from people who do poorly are the ones that A, recognize they've fallen off the wagon and whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the particular wagon is, and then are able, without catastrophizing, or just say, well, you know, I've been doing this and I'm just going to go all the way down. That's right. Bottom, right? That's right. So that's the same. Yeah. It's that same. So yeah. there's something about that willingness to start over. Yeah. Oh, right. absolutely. It's really, really crucial. And that's a beautiful. Um, elaboration of that, you know, into into life, because it does come into life, and we don't practice meditation for that, say, 20 minute period to become a great meditator. Yeah. We practice to help us in life, and that's one of the ways it really does. And and also, I just think real clarity about what to expect and what not to expect, because I don't think most people will trust that information and probably need to hear it again and again and again and again. The purpose is not to make your mind blank. We're not trying to eradicate all thinking. If you have like only crummy thoughts and not spiritual and lofty thoughts, it's not a problem. The whole uh, premise certainly of mindfulness is that we're about changing our relationship to what's happening, not changing what's happening. You know, so we're so content driven in so many ways I think and we judge ourselves so mercilessly like oh no I had a bad thought I had 80 thoughts whatever it is and and instead to be reminded over and over that the whole point is to change that relationship so maybe the thought comes but it doesn't carry you away mm -hmm. yeah, you know you can drop it something like that and then do you ever find that you get into some people get into infinite regresses though where then they beat themselves up for not changing their relationship I mean it really is very interesting but that, that seems to me to be just hugely impactful point. Of course, that point has made its way now into to some psychotherapeutic things, where, you know, uh, acceptance commitment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. ACT, where people, there's this recognition that one of the things that, that for many people who struggle with depression, the thing that will take them down the bad foxhole and lead to a relapse is, you know, that unlike people that don't have that problem, who have negative thoughts and sort of let them go, the depressed person gets stuck on, oh, right, I really right. to lose anyway. Yeah. It's, it, it, yeah, you know, it's, it's it's exactly that process you're talking about yeah. that the meditation training attempts yeah. to to short circuit. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, tell talk, talk to me a little bit about how you see the relationship of loving kindness meditation, which you've done such an amazing thing, you know, sort of of making accessible to people in the West. Uh, the relationship between that and mindfulness, how did you know? It, this is a, a research question that's sort of interesting too for many of us is how do they how do they stand in relationship to each other and you said something that's just really intriguing right now that that the act that that, that loving kindness or being able to have loving kindness with self uh, helps one let go yeah but tell me more about that because that's such an interesting area well I think I think that um, in the development of concentration where we're constantly letting go and coming back and letting go and coming back loving kindness is like the secret ingredient even if it's never given voice because uh, you can't let go and start over without some loving kindness we just go down another route you know blaming ourselves and chastising ourselves and comparing ourselves to other people and that can be a long that's a long path <laughs> that's a familiar path <laughs> yeah you know so uh, lots of iterations on that path and and um so even if it's not articulated we're actually deepening loving kindness for ourselves every time we practice letting go and starting over. But I think, of, I think of mindfulness training really as kind of uncluttering our attention so that the normal filters aren't so strong. Yeah. Um, I've got to get rid of that thought or I have to hold on to that feeling or 
uh, this is going to last forever or, or whatever it might be that, that tends to come in very strongly and really distort our relationship to what we're perceiving in the moment. Um, so we kind of loosen the grip of some of those filters and mindfulness. And I think of loving kindness practice in terms of attention training being more about flexibility. <clears throat> you know, like if we're accustomed to at the end of the day thinking about our day, thinking about ourselves, and all we remember is what we did wrong and the mistakes we made and the really stupid thing we said at lunch at that meeting. So much so that our whole sense of who we are and all that we will ever be like collapses mm -hmm. around that really stupid thing we said. The loving kindness process is almost like asking ourselves, anything else happened today? Mm -hmm. Like anything good? Any good within me? So we consciously shift our attention or the way we pay attention to ourselves, but you know, so many people have the fear that it's kind of phony and make believe, and but it's not. It's not like you're saying it wasn't that a brilliant and witty thing I said at lunch <laughs> at that meeting. Maybe it was really stupid, you know, and there are consequences for that. But that's not all that we are ever. So it's that rigidity of perception, like I am only an idiot, you know, and I always will be. And we're saying, hey, there's good within me. May I be happy? Yes. And and uh, we practice having a greater flexibility of attention in terms of who we pay attention to. Like, what about all those many beings that appear in our lives that are, you know, checkout person in the supermarket or something like that we look right through yeah. that we objectify to the extent that they might as well be a piece of furniture. You know, what happens when we look at them yeah. instead of look through them? And that's what we're doing through the loving kindness practices, calling people like that to mind and wishing them well. And so, um, it's not really meant to uh, kind of force us to have a feeling we don't actually have, but to be so flexible with the way we pay attention that it's like we're creating the space for, for other kinds of connection to come and forward. So talk a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, about some of the pragmatics. I, you know, uh, I think many people have a sense that, that what we think of as meditation is something about things like watching the breath, learning yeah. to focus, yeah. and then becoming sort of more non-judgmentally aware of, of one's thoughts and feelings. I think, I think mindfulness practices, and, and, and of course you teach something that's often known as meta, uh, not mindfulness, compassion practices, are less well understood. Mm -hmm. So what, I, you, you, just a quick primer on sure. how it works. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, instead of centering our attention on the feeling of the breath, we would center our attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases. Um, and the phrases are almost like um, an offering. It's like a gift giving. So the first recipient is ourselves. We offer these phrases to ourselves, which means we're paying attention to ourselves in a certain way. And then we offer the phrases to others. So common phrases, are, they need to be really simple because you don't want to like always be thinking, what should I use for you? You know, like, so they need to be very general so that you can basically use the same phrases, you know, in most cases, like um, with few exceptions. So it could be like, may I be happy, may I be peaceful. And uh, it's not meant to be in a tone like begging, you know, uh, or <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know. Yeah. But it's like if I gave you a birthday card and said, may you have a happy birthday, may you have a great new year, it, it's something like that. And we start with ourselves. And then using those same phrases, maybe we visualize someone who's really helped us um, or just call them to mind. Um, Someone who's really, uh, either they've helped us directly or maybe we've never met them, but they've really inspired us and, and we feel really good about them, we offer the phrases to them. And then a friend, and then a neutral person, someone like that checkout Check person, person. Yeah. Uh, dry cleaner is a favorite one, and, uh, and then maybe someone we have a little bit of difficulty with, not right away the person who's the most outrageous um, to even imagine, but someone we have a little bit of annoyance or conflict with, just to see what happens if, you know, when, when we have some difficulty with somebody, we tend to go over the list of their faults again and again and again and again, and there's no room for anything else. And so we're just trying to see what happens if we include that, the list of their faults, but not limit that. Yeah you know, that awareness of them to that. And so we kind of play, and then ultimately all beings everywhere. We just have this kind of global offering. That's right. And, and, and when you teach it, over what kind of time frame do you move from sort of aspirational wishing toward the self to the sort of whoever you most want to, you know, 
<laughs> and beyond. <laughs> um, it's, you know, when I teach it, I teach it so that uh, I teach whatever time frame I have. Yeah. Um, because my goal in teaching is that people leave with enough confidence and clarity that if they want to continue, they can continue. So you'd run through each of the phases yeah. and, and have them try out. Yeah, the, the, that's right. It's unlikely you will say we have a weekend that you will resolve everything, yeah. you know, <laughs> even with yourself in the weekend, but you have the tool. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. What do you, and, and what do you find when people do the, the aspirational sort of practices, wishing practices for people they really, really struggle with? Do you get, you must get interesting reports about people mm -hmm. finding it difficult or sometimes finding it liberating or do you find out how does that um it's difficult for sure and it's it's a, a very tender realm you don't want to force anything but it's also um i don't know that i, I think usually if there's a shift it's in the realm it's in the um fields of compassion you get a sense of poignancy about this person like look at their choices and um given that we all want to be happy, given that we're all so vulnerable to loss and to change, we actually share so much. And uh, It's a little bit like one of those feelings like maybe you have a friend or a family member who says they're really lonely, but they're so off-putting. Mm -hmm. The way they talk to people, the way they treat people, and you look at them sometimes and they go, no wonder, you know? Course, yeah. It's like no one wants to get near you, but sometimes that realization shifts and you think, oh man, look how you've blown it. Yeah. You know, like you, you are really lonely and it could be different, but it's not. Yes. Your choices are just so bad and look what look at the consequences of that and you don't even see why, you know. So yes. there's so much poignancy in that and, yeah, sure. and so it's a little bit like that feeling I think that, that starts to emerge. I will also say that one of the very interesting things which may make it impossible to research, I'm not sure, I found about loving kindness and compassion practice is that so often the effects um, are not felt most directly and certainly not most immediately in the formal practice. Yeah. You might feel it more strongly if you run into that cousin yes. at a party yes. and you realize, oh, you know, I'm different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is what our, some of the, some of the kids, college kids, when I first studied with compassion training, these were, this is what people would say, it is exactly that. You know, they would, they would run into the person and they would mess with their minds a little bit, you know, they would, yeah. they would uh, you said something interesting here. I've never thought of before either, which is, you know, the the, the premise of compassion practices is, is this strong shared destiny of yeah. the person yeah. doing the meditation and the person that you're thinking about. Yeah. Do people ever notice that that you know? So you think about somebody that's really causing you trouble, as you and, and as you noted, it's 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 pretty easy to see people's shortcomings when you have those sort of feelings towards them. But you, you said, you know, that, that we all make these sort of choices that cause us trouble. Has it been your experience that people sort of get a sense by, by, by doing the practice for somebody they really have conflict with, that by beginning to see that person as somebody that's made, that because of the way they're whatever, you know, even if you think, well, they deserve it, they act a certain way, blah, 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 but still they suffer those consequences. It's sort of a window, it is, does it ever work backwards where people then begin to see themselves you know what I'm saying, in some sort of special way, because in particular, with somebody that they really have upset feelings for, it's easy to see the negative. There's something that's interesting. It's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it really is true in that way that the, the, the sort of the enemy, the person one conflicts with, is a powerful teacher. It's a very powerful teacher. Yeah. Yeah. That that's one of the concepts that's been most amazing to me about I think sort of compassion meditation is that is that particular idea. Um, what something that, that that's interesting, I, you know. So the, some of the work we've done has been more related that the, the compassion practices come from a slightly different sort of ancient tradition, that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I, we've done this work with uh, you know uh, Tibetan Buddhist scholars, especially my good friend Geshe Lobsang. And one of the things that's not in traditional, you know, I'm going with this in traditional Tibetan practices is compassion for the self. I know. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I've seen these sort of transcripts of early, early conversations with the Dalai Lama where he was like, what, what do you mean, uh, low self-esteem? Oh, yeah, that was me. That was <laughs> <laughs> me. <laughs> well, can you talk? Can you talk a little bit about that experience and sort of, because there's something that's, that, it is a very intriguing thing that people sometimes say is unique to the West, 
don't know if I believe that, but there is something cultural there. That, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it, it wasn't uh, particularly about low self-esteem. This was 89 or 90 when I was at a Mind and Life conference in Dharamsala, and yeah. I had the opportunity to ask the Dalai Lama question, and so I said, um, what do you think of, of self-hatred? And he said, what's that? <laughs> it was really interesting because there were, you know, philosophers and uh, scholars and psychologists in the room. And everyone, like, jumped in, you know, and he was like, huh. And, and he said, uh, is it some kind of nervous disorder? <laughs> you know, and it was like, it was very funny. It was very funny, just like kind of complete incomprehension. And this is not to deify Asian culture, you know, or, or Tibetan culture, but I think that rock-bottom belief that if we really knew who we were, it would be a pretty sad story. That's different. Yes. You know, there's such a sense of potential. Even if you're a mess, even if you've fallen apart, even if you're far, far, far away from being a kind and happy person, you have the potential. And it's believed uh, that potential is never, ever destroyed. Yeah. It may be covered over, it may be hidden from us, but it is never, ever destroyed. So wherever you are, whatever you've done in your life, you've got that potential, yeah. and so you can get back to it. Right. In fact, it cannot be destroyed. It cannot be right. destroyed. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there's a sense that one's weakness and flaws, or they use the word adventitious, but it, that they are non-essential. Yeah, they're visiting. Yeah, they're, yeah visiting. they're visiting. They're nasty visitors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so in, 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 the, in the Theravada tradition, you know, that was sort of informed your early training, is there that same assumption? And, and so this, the, the compassion for the self, is that more, this is just me, my ignorance, is, is, is that more recognized in the Theravadan context? Or was that something that you folks elaborated? No, 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 it was right there. I mean, it, I, I, mean I, I brought the practice um, to the West just as it had been given to me. And, uh, and it starts with yourself. So that's the yeah. difference within the different yeah. The, yeah. The Buddhist schools. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's right there. And you start with yourself. And um, I went to Burma in 1985 to do three months of intensive loving kindness training. And uh, I did three weeks of loving kindness just for myself and a benefactor, you know, by that the end of that period. And so um, it's a tremendous platform um, for the greater extension of... But, you know, there's also... Um, as a teacher, I feel great flexibility. You know, in the West, they say, you know, in, in Burma, like they say you start with yourself because that's easiest. Yeah. And you're trying to build confidence in the techniques out in the West, and not always the easiest <laughs> no. by any means. And so, you know, I, I tell people, not because it's second best, but because it's the right thing to do. If you have great difficulty offering love and kindness to yourself, start with a friend. You know, tuck yourself in later. Uh, do it in the way that is actually going to work for you. Yeah. And so one of the things, so when Geshe Lohsan <coughs> decided that, that, that there needed to be compassion for the self in this, in this uh, the program that he developed, he, uh, he kind of stuck to his, his, his traditional guns a little bit in that he, he framed that aspirational wish to be happy and free of suffering sort of in terms of, of, of helping people recognize that if one wants that, the, the best way to achieve that is to change one's attitudes, one's behavior, you know, in other words, you start kind of moving toward a path where you're not as afflicted emotionally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, that, is, is that sort of a similar thing in the, the meta tradition, or, or how, how I it? think it could be seen that way. I mean, basically, I see loving kindness and compassion practice as a form of generosity. And like any kind, you know, and we use material generosity just sometimes as an example because it's so much more concrete and it helps us understand, you know, how other things are working. So um, in material generosity, there's some ingredient, like some sense of inner abundance or sufficiency yeah. that allows us to give. Because you could have a huge amount externally, but not have a feeling you have nearly enough. Right. And so no matter how much you've compiled or accumulated, it's much harder to give. Right. So it's that inner sense that um, the loving kindness for oneself is also working on. Because if you feel, and this is very important for caregivers, for example, if you feel depleted, you're exhausted, you're overcome, you're not going to have a whole lot of juice, you know, for continuing to give. Or, or serve or care even, you know, it's like, it's too much. And so 
it's building up that resourcefulness, that almost resiliency that the loving kindness for oneself is doing. So, um, and it works in that way. I mean, I think what uh, Geshe Lopsan was talking about is almost like a further elaboration of that. Yeah. But I see it almost just in terms of sheer energy. Yeah. It's like, because otherwise, it's like you can't go on. Yes. And, and so it's not selfish, and it's not self-absorbed, and it's not self-preoccupied. It's not a mistake. You know, it's, it's really, and I always come back to that example of material giving, because it helps me a lot just right. to and, continue. And material give, you have to have something to give. That's yeah. the other thing. Right? Yeah. You have to be willing to give it, but people are more likely to give if they've got something to give. And, and, in, and when people feel that there is an excess, they're more likely to give too. I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, when, yeah. when bad financial times come, you know, donations plummet because everybody starts, you know, a sense of, of lack is a great way to make people kind of, you know, that's right. Fill everything in and that's right. And, 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 and lock the gates. And so that sense, because I, you know, one of the one of the interesting things about the passion practices is, of course. And it's sort of a mystery in the, although I think we've learned some in the last 10 years, but you know, there's certain ways that people relate powerfully to the emotions of others that increase depression, increase yeah. anxiety, yeah. Right? Yeah. emotional contagion, you know, you, yeah. you, 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 and so this idea that you're going to somehow become more emotionally connected and vulnerable with the pain and suffering of others, uh, you know, sometimes people raise half an eyebrow, right? But, but my understanding is that it's this, that, that, it, that that as with all things human, if you feel that you've got a means to do something about it, that's right. You know, if you've got a means to cope, if you can be proactive towards it, that it, it, that's the trick that seems to avoid mm -hmm. that feeling of despair and, and, and giving up. So that, this is what we're talking about, I guess, in a way, isn't it? That yeah. You know, building yeah. Up, you've got the resources to help. Yeah. And I would say, just out of my training, you know, that another ingredient um, in f in uh, not plunging into despair is equanimity. It's wisdom. It's realizing that, you know, I'm going to do everything I can. And ultimately, this is not my universe to control. Yeah. I can't be responsible for making it all better. I can contribute. You know, I can participate. I can engage because that's the right thing to do. But as soon as I feel like I'm in charge, it's, it's over, you know, because life doesn't seem to behave according, sadly. nicely according, very sadly, according to our dictates, you know. So there's got to be some balance there. Um, so that touches upon something. I mean, so, you know, meditation is widely taught in the secular context, you know. I mean, you know, folks don't need to become Buddhist to, to, to benefit from, from these practices that derive from Buddhist practice. But something that I've often wondered about is what you're touching upon now, which is that there is it's not a specific theology, but you've said something that, that is, is a, you know, it's an articulation of a proposal about a very deep truth about the universe, which is that suffering is sort of inherent to the realm we find ourselves in, and that, 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 it, that there are hardcore limits to its perfectibility. Okay, and before we stop, can you, how does that, there, there's something there that's very deep, because if you don't have that perspective, you could really become distressed, depressed, because bad things do happen. Yeah. The people you wish happiness yeah. for yeah. Uh, may well not find it. Yeah. So, well, I think, you know, I, I mean, I think one of the... Um, one of the genius uh, organizations of our time is, is AA. Yeah. And uh, you'll see it all there. You know, don't be codependent. Um, there's so much wisdom. In, in that perspective. Well, the book is pretty intense. Yeah, you know, and it's, and it's sort of like not um, the language I feel most aligned with or, you know, way of saying things, but uh, we have a kind of contemporary psychological understanding of not being codependent, doing everything you can but not feeling overly responsible, you know, and so if we can extend that to the practice of compassion meditation, I think it would, it would provide a lot of that. No, I think that's a great, I think that's a very very good point. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for talking with us. It, 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 as always, I, thanks for the teaching. Actually, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, it was fantastic. Let's go. Cool. Thank you all. Um, thanks, Adam. He's listening. Okay. <laughs>
Um, thank you very, very oh, much. Thank you. So I, I, well, I don't know if those were the subject areas that... I didn't get to hear it. I found it very interesting. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. he's on headphones. Yeah. And so, uh, okay. so I'll get to hear it. Um, yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was very... Adam says it's great. Really interesting.